Welcome to Classroom TV. Today I'm going to talk about the topic that is transportation and how transportation is done in humans. So I'll be talking about transportation in humans and later on I'll be talking about transportation in plants and comparison between the both. So before I begin the topic, I would like to ask you guys, what do you see on the screen? I can see a motor pump. This is used in India where it is used to pump water from a lower level to the tank and from tank the water is distributed to all parts of the home. Right? Everyone know this fact. So what is the purpose of this pump? The main purpose is it is pumping water. So that like from a point it's pumping water and it is made available to all parts of the home. Similarly, we have a pump in our body. Yes, we do have a pump in our body. And does that pump pump water? No, that pump helps in pumping of blood to all parts of the body. And that organ which is pumping blood is nothing but the heart. So heart can be compared to a motor pump because it is helping in pumping of blood to all parts of our body. Now, heart is a part of circulatory system. When we hear about circulatory system, we think that it's only about heart, right? It's not true because circulatory system actually has three main features. Heart is definitely an important factor, but fluid as well as uh, the blood vessels that is arteries, veins and capillaries are also part of it. Now, what do I mean by fluid? Why do we need blood to be transported? So basically, what does the heart do is it's pumping blood. Now it pumps impure blood as well as pure blood. I'll be talking about that later. But let me tell you an interesting story. This is William Harvey, the scientist who actually said that this is how the pumping of blood happens. Now before William Harvey, in France long ago, there was an interesting concept where they have thought that actually heart is not purifying the blood because they used to think that it might be liver or it might be lungs. And you know what they did long back? They used to actually use leeches. Leeches are the parasites that suck the blood of the humans, right? They thought that something, if a person is suffering with some sort of a disease, it might be because he has a bad blood. And they used to use this leech to suck the blood out and then it will heal by itself. But imagine, like using a parasite to literally take out the blood is not at all hygienic and forget about hygienic it's going to make the patient worse so before William Harvey conducted his experiments and proved that it's not the liver or the lungs it's the heart who is doing the job they used to use leeches and then they used to use whatnot like no one knew that something like heart exists so what did William Harvey say is that it is heart is performing dual function like what is it doing is heart is going to take the deoxygenated blood or the impure blood and send it to the lungs and at lungs this blood is purified and then it is sent back to the heart from which heart sends the blood to all parts of the body so it's like a double circulation now i'll repeat it in an another way so basically deoxygenated blood means the blood that has carbon dioxide now we cannot have the blood that has carbon dioxide right it's like a waste product you need to purify the blood so what does the heart do is when it receives the deoxygenated blood or the blood that is having carbon dioxide it sends all of this blood to lungs and at lungs it's purified now the blood has oxygen now why do we really need oxygen in the blood it's because even at cellular level, for the organism to stay alive, it needs oxygen. So in order to get that oxygen distributed to all parts of the body, the lungs is going to purify the blood and send it back to the heart. 
from heart now it is distributed to all parts of the body this is where the pumping process occurs where it acts as a pump that is pumping oxygenated blood to all parts of the body isn't that interesting imagine if william harvey didn't exist we would be having leeches used even now so i would like to share a video with you guys how the heart shape came into existence initially people used to imagine that heart is something this shape no one knew why but long ago in like 540 bc that was the oldest known picture of the heart but later on they came to know that you can hear a beat right it looks like something is pumping something is heavy on your left side so what did the uh, doctors and scientists try to understand is what is really the shape of the heart so many scientists couldn't find a proper picture and doctors also couldn't have a clear picture until and unless they cut the heart yes they always thought that heart something looks like this so they had to when a surgeon is performing a surgery they had to cut it open in order to see how the heart is so that is the reason only doctors were able to study the heart properly because only when you dissect the heart from inside that is when you know exactly how the heart looks only then you get this picture like when you slice it that's when you know the picture you don't know the picture from outside then doctors knew that okay when they cut the heart they are seeing that there is something pumping going on and then they did some studies and came to a conclusion that the actually the heart is going to pump the deoxygenated blood that is in the blue color and it's get purified and then this is the red color representing the pure blood and from which it is distributed to all parts of the body so that is the reason many people don't know the exact like even we don't know how it looks only cardiologists or the doctors who does a detailed study will know about everything about the heart that's why we have heart surgeons right a surgeon and a heart surgeon is different because only if you cut it dissect it and know in detail is when you really know how the heart looks so do you think like heart is pumping water because you keep it in water and then it squeezes in the water and then it pumps the water it's not so actually heart doesn't pump water like i explained earlier it pumps blood this part is the impure blood and this part is the pure blood and i'll be talking about what are the parts and everything later but for now understand that our heart is a hard worker because it keeps pumping blood throughout our life because even once for a while if a heart stops beating we are dead so isn't the heart a real hard worker so another thing i would like to tell you guys is imagine this is the tap water right similarly this is the bad blood that is pumping in so the function of this part which is called as ventricle is the upper parts are atria and the lower parts are ventricles so when you squeeze in that is how the blood goes out to the lungs so that is what is meant by pumping action okay and there are some doors here there are three wall doors and two wall doors over here okay so those are called as atrioventricular valves i'll be talking about that in detail but i just want you guys to have an overview so now that we know that our heart pump blood and it has something called uh, atrioventricular valves which help in like pumping of the blood they act like a door they are closed sometimes and open whenever it's open it means it's going to pump the blood so those are the different uh, parts of our heart okay so heart is mainly comprised of two atria two ventricles and atrioventricular valves that exist between atria and ventricle now i'll tell you an interesting story if you see your favorite ones or if you see your favorite coke or ice cream you might feel like you skipped the heartbeat right do you know why is it because your heart is happy think about that okay so i hope we are clear on how this heart works so ancient times like i told you people used to collect the leeches and like try it out on humans so 
Now coming to types of circulatory system. There are actually two types of circulatory system. One is open circulatory system and another is closed circulatory system. So in the earlier classes, we have discussed about cells, tissues and pretty much a lot of things. So we know that between organs and like for example, if the blood has to reach all parts of our body, we have something called capillaries, right? Now, what do I mean by that is in open type of in open type of circulatory system that is missing and in closed type of circulatory system, the blood is circulated through blood vessels. Now, what do I mean by that? Suppose think this is blood. Now, if blood has to reach heart, it is happening only with the help of blood vessels. So, if blood vessels doesn't exist, it would be something like this, right? So, this type of circulatory system is called as open type of circulatory system, whereas this type of circulatory system is called as closed type of circulatory system. Did you guys understand what I mean by that? So, open type of circulatory system means imagine I'm having an open type of circulatory system. So I won't have any vessels or something. Whatever blood is there, it just keeps flowing everywhere. Okay. And we are mammals and we don't have open type of circulatory system. Only humans have open type of circulatory system. Now let us talk about blood vessels. So we have arteries, veins and capillaries. And the function of arteries is they carry blood away from the heart. Okay. So what is the function of the veins then? They carry blood towards the heart. So this is the structure of the heart. We have right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, AV valves. And these are pulmonary artery and this is the pulmonary vein. And the blood will go from the pulmonary artery to the lungs. It's going to get purified and come back to the pulmonary vein. Okay. And now, it's always said that arteries carry pure blood except pulmonary artery because pulmonary artery carries impure blood. So always remember that it's not true if you are asked in your exams that all the arteries carry pure blood. It's not so. There is an exception and that is pulmonary artery. So this is how an artery looks like. Now coming to the vein. So veins always carry impure blood. Like remember, whenever you see a vein in your books or in videos, it's always represented with a blue color. Okay, but one vein carries pure blood. That is pulmonary vein. So it's not true that arteries always carry pure blood and veins always carry impure blood. So I hope you know the difference between artery and veins. Okay, for now, remember that arteries carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood towards the heart. So this is what I wanted to make sure that you guys understand. Now let's talk about types of circulatory system. Like I have explained, there are two types of circulatory system. One is open type of circulatory system and another one is closed type of circulatory system. Now what happens in open type of circulatory system? Like I have explained to you, this is the heart and you don't have any vessels, just there is blood flowing everywhere. That is called as open type of circulatory system. Whereas closed type of circulatory system has blood vessels that is going to pump blood away and like it takes blood away from the heart and it brings blood towards the heart. So there are two types of circulatory system. Now, which kind of circulatory system do we have? We do have arteries, veins, capillaries, and you guys are aware of that, right? So we are definitely closed type of circulatory system. And let me tell you something interesting. You know, there are some animals which have more than one heart. Yes, like octopus has eight hearts. And like how many hearts do we have? We have only one heart, right? Arthropods have open type of circulatory system. Now, like I told you, open type of circulatory system means they do not have blood vessels. Fish has two chambered heart. 
amphibians have three chambered hearts and reptiles also have three chambered hearts. So if someone asks you a question that all have just one heart, that's not true. Some has two hearts, some has three hearts, some has eight hearts. Okay, so but we have only one heart. Now, circulatory system generally has three main features. Like I have told you, we always think that circulatory systems means only heart. No, circulatory system comprises of three things. That is one is the blood and another one is the vessels that is capillaries arteries and veins and then comes the heart heart is very important because it is like the pump that is pumping the blood but still always remember that circulatory system comprises of three things now about the location of the heart so this is the rib cage and our heart is located right behind the sternum on the left side okay always remember that the heart is located in the rib cage behind the sternum always tilted to the left side so our heart is always towards the left and it is 14 centimeters long and it is 9 centimeters wide so we can always feel a heart towards the left right but let me tell you something there is a disorder where the heart can be on the right side not on the left side yes that's possible and that rare genetic disorder is called as dextrocardia where the person would be having the heart on the right side not on the left side and coming to the size of the heart like i have explained to you you can also imagine the size of the heart as the size of your fist yes your heart is just so small but yet it does so many functions now coming to pericardium so what is pericardium? You all might have ordered glassware or your parents would have said that, hey, make sure that the glasses are safe. And what do you do for that? You pack them in the boxes, right? And you make sure that it's at a safe place by packing it in like a thermocol box or like a cardboard box filled with a lot of cotton or something so that there is no breaking of the glass. And our heart is also not just is not just exposed. It has some protective covering. Like if this is the heart, it has a covering all over it. And that covering is called as pericardium. That is the protective layer of the heart. So what it does, the functions of it is it protects the heart it protects the heart as well as it acts as a shock absorber so that is the function of the pericardium now i have told you that see this flap of the this flap here is called as pericardium it is the outermost layer okay so now what are the parts of the heart? It's always easy to imagine heart like this for now, but please don't draw that in the exam. I'm just drawing it so that you guys can understand clearly. So remember that there are four parts of four parts in the heart. That is right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. And remember that there is three door like thing here and two door like thing here. So this is called tricuspid valve. And this is bicuspid valve. And remember that from here the blood goes out to the lungs like this. And first the blood is going to enter the heart through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. I'll be discussing about that in detail but anyways I just wanted you guys to know what is the basic structure of the heart. So our heart is surrounded by pericardium. It has right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Now blood is reaching the right atrium from two things superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Okay now the structure of the human heart includes the following. It has two atrium and two ventricles. Like remember, this is the heart. This is the right atrium, left atrium. 
right ventricle left ventricle so the two atria they are the smaller chambers near the top of the heart that collects the body from the that collects the blood from the body and the lungs whereas two ventricles are the larger portion that is present near the bottom of the heart that pump the blood to the lungs as well as to all parts of the body so it is going to pump blood to all parts of the body as well as to the lungs so for now we know that the heart is covered by a outer layer that is called as pericardium and it has four chambers that is right atrium right ventricle left atrium left ventricle and the right atrium is going to receive the blood from like how is the blood going to enter right ventricle it is going to receive the blood from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava and the function of the ventricles would be pumping the blood to the lungs and also pumping the blood to all parts of the body now so if anyone asks you what are the functions of pericardium can you guys tell me what is the function of the pericardium if this is the heart this is the pericardium so pericardium is nothing but the outermost structure that protects the heart and also acts as shock absorber okay now we also know what is the function of artery vein and capillaries like i told you arteries always carry pure blood and they carry the blood away from the heart an exception to the fact that artery carries pure blood is called pulmonary artery and the vein carries blood to the heart and veins are always represented by blue color because it always carries impure blood but an exception is pulmonary vein which carries pure blood and capillaries are like you know they are the junction between arteries and veins where they help in exchange of um, nutrients waste and gases okay so i hope you guys are clear on what it is now coming to arteries so arteries are thick walled and are lined by smooth muscles so they are thick walled and they are lined by smooth muscles so they are thick walled and are lined by smooth muscle so always remember that what is the main function of the artery it carries blood away from the heart whereas vein brings so an easy example is artery right remember a for away okay now so arteries are always represented with the color red because it signifies that it carries pure blood but an artery that carries impure blood is called as pulmonary artery okay now veins have thinner walls than capillaries so in this picture like i told you red always represents artery whereas blue always represents veins okay and a for away so remember that artery carries blood away from the heart and veins carry blood towards the heart and now the capillaries is present in between the artery and veins which helps in exchange of gases and making sure that they are, the wastage wastage waste products are eliminated okay so the capillary walls are only one cell thick allowing exchange of gases nutrients and waste so capillaries are present in between the artery and the veins so remember 
we have three main things in blood vessels. One is arteries, veins and capillaries. Arteries, veins and capillaries. Arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Veins always carry blood towards the heart. And arteries are always represented with red color because they carry pure blood except pulmonary arteries. Veins always are represented with the color blue and they carry impure blood or deoxygenated blood but the exception is pulmonary vein and the capillaries in between the main function of them is that they help in exchange of gases and waste products are eliminated. Now coming to the heart valves. So there are some valves in between atria and ventricle. Let me draw a picture. So, remember, this is right atrium. This is right ventricle. This is left atrium, this is left ventricle. See, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Between right atrium and right ventricle, there is three-door thing that is called as tricuspid valve. And in between left atrium and left ventricle, there is bicuspid valve. Okay. And from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, the blood is going to enter right atrium so what happens is these valves are called atrioventricular valves because they are present in between atria and ventricle that's the reason they're called atrioventricular valves and um, they are also called as semilunar there are semilunar valves which are like half moon shaped so remember tricuspid valve exists only between right atrium and right ventricle and bicuspid valve exists between left atrium and left ventricle and we know what are the blood vessels that is this is the superior vena cava and this is the inferior vena cava This is pulmonary artery and this is pulmonary veins. Okay, so this is pretty much about heart. Now, how does the heart work? Now, we know the parts of the heart. So, can you guys repeat the parts of the heart along with me? So, this is the right atrium. This is the right ventricle. In between right atrium and right ventricle, we have tricuspid valve this is the left atrium this is the left ventricle between the left atrium and the left ventricle we have bicuspid valve this is the blood vessel superior vena cava and inferior vena cava pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins so this is pretty much about the parts of the heart now coming to the working of the heart so what happens is deoxygenated blood or the impure blood is going to enter the heart through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava these they are going to enter right atrium so what happens is now the tricuspid valve is going to open so that the right atrium can dump its blood into the right ventricle so as the atrium contracts it has to contract in order to push the blood so as atrium contracts the blood enters the right ventricle through tricuspid valve the valve is called as tricuspid valve once the right ventricle is full the valve is closed so why are the valves opening and closing so for, in order for the blood to enter from right atrium to right ventricle the door opens once the ventricle is filled with the blood it's going to close why is it going to get closed this is an important question which is very important for different uh, at different points of uh, your life because it can be asked in school college and at any point because the ventricles prevent the backward flow Okay, so these valves prevent the backward flow. That is the reason why these valves are being working that way. So what happens first, the blood is going to enter from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava into the right atrium. And once it enters, this door that is the tricuspid valve, it's going to open. And when 
once it opens the blood will go to the right ventricle once it's filled this door is going to shut so that it can prevent the backward flow okay and once it shuts this blood is going to go to the pulmonary artery through the pulmonary valve to the lungs it will go to the lungs where the blood is going to get purified and once it is purified the oxygenated blood is going to enter the heart through pulmonary veins and from the pulmonary veins it's going to go to left atrium left ventricle and it's going to be distributed to all parts of the body through aorta so it's very simple i will repeat it so that you guys have a clear understanding okay so let me show you a clear picture of the heart so here first the blood is entering the heart through vessels that is superior vena cava and inferior vena cava once the blood is entering the right atrium right atrium will say hey tricuspid valve please open so once the blood comes from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava the tricuspid valve is going to open and the blood is going to flow from right atrium to right ventricle once the ventricle is filled with the blood the door is going to shut okay the tricuspid valve will shut so as to prevent the backward flow now the blood from the right ventricle is going to from the right ventricle it will go to lungs through pulmonary artery where the blood is purified and then like see the blood from the right ventricle will go to the pulmonary artery through pulmonary valve where it gets purified in the lungs and it comes back through the pulmonary veins now this is the oxygenated blood which is going to enter from left atrium to left ventricle through the opening of bicuspid valve and from there the good blood or the oxygenated blood is distributed to all parts of the body through aorta so now i want you guys to take a small quiz with me name the artery that carries deoxygenated blood and where are av valves located what is the function of capillaries explain the working of heart okay so the artery that carries deoxygenated blood is pulmonary artery arteries always carry blood away from the heart and veins carry blood towards the heart arteries are always represented with the red color because they carry pure blood but one of the exception is pulmonary artery now where are the av valves located av valves by the name itself it suggests that av so av valves are located between vein the atria and the ventricles okay and there are two kinds of valves that is tricuspid valve and bicuspid valve okay where is this tricuspid valve located tricuspid valve is located between right atrium and right ventricle and bicuspid valve is located between left atrium and left ventricle and the artery that carries deoxygenated blood is pulmonary artery what is the function of the capillaries they are present between the arteries and the veins and they help in exchange of gases nutrients and they help to get rid of waste products also explain the working of the heart it's very simple so the veins that is superior vena cava and inferior vena cava are going to get the impure blood to the right atrium the right atrium is filled with the blood now the 
tricuspid valve will open and the blood will enter right ventricle. Right ventricle will be filled with the blood and then the valve is going to get closed so as to prevent backward flow and from the right ventricle the blood is going through pulmonary valve to it is going to get um, purified in the in the lungs and then the oxygenated blood through the pulmonary artery and the oxygenated blood is going to enter the heart through pulmonary veins and from there the blood is going to good blood or oxygenated blood is going to enter the left atrium and the bicuspid valve is going to open and then it enters the right ventricle and now from right ventricle the blood is from the left ventricle the blood is distributed to all parts of the body through aorta. I will explain it with the help of the video so that you have more better understanding. Now I hope you guys have understood all about the heart at least like what are the parts of the heart, how does the heart works, what is artery, what is vein and um, so it's very important to know the parts in detail and I would be explaining in the next class with the help of some videos. So thanks for watching and stay tuned to Classroom TV. Thank you. Initially, I'll be covering about transportation in human beings. That would be like a continuation of the previous class that is about the heart. And then I would be covering transportation in plants. Okay. So in the previous session, I have explained to you guys that heart acts like a pump. It helps in transportation of blood to all parts of the body. It transports deoxygenated blood, which goes to the lungs, gets purified and is distributed to all parts of our body. Now, let us um, go through the working of the heart once again, because it's very important. So as I have explained, always blue is for deoxygenated blood okay and red represents oxygenated blood so the blood enters the heart through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava okay so the deoxygenated blood is entering the heart through superior vena cava and inferior vena cava it first enters right atrium Okay, these are very important parts. So, first let us name the parts and go to the working. Okay. So, if anyone asks you, name the parts of circulatory system, you can't just say that there are two atriums, two ventricles and that's it. You need to name everything in detail. Like here. What I mean by that is you need to name superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, then right atrium, right ventricle. Then I told you that there are three cusps between right atrium and right ventricle, which acts like a door and that is called as tricuspid valve. It's easy to remember because it has three cusps, so it's tricuspid valve. And then in between left atrium and left ventricle, you have a two door version. Okay, so it's basically like a two uh, folded door okay so that is the bicuspid valve and you have pulmonary artery that carries deoxygenated blood and you have pulmonary vein that carries oxygenated blood okay so, let me tell you guys something. Always arteries carry pure blood, whereas veins carry impure blood. Okay. So, but that is not true for pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein because pulmonary artery is carrying impure blood over here. Right. And pulmonary vein is carrying pure blood. So, this is a tricky question which will be repeated in your uh, 10th it will be repeated in your 11th and 12th and even in future where whenever you take science because this is a tricky question because it's like everyone assumes that artery always carries pure blood and veins always carry impure blood but that's not true in this case okay so 
we have named the parts so i hope we are clear on the parts that is the right atrium right ventricle left atrium left ventricle superior vena cava inferior vena cava tricuspid valve bicuspid valve then pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein and also i have told you guys this the whole heart is covered by a covering just like how our glass boxes are covered in a thermocol whenever you order from amazon or any other site that is called as pericardium okay so this is the outermost covering which protects the heart so we have named the parts right now so let's go to the working now what is the working of the heart so whenever the deoxygenated blood comes from superior vena cava and inferior vena cava it goes to right atrium okay and what happens when right atrium is filled with blood right it needs to push the blood to the right ventricle and how will it happen because imagine this is right atrium and this is right ventricle so this is filled with blood so if it has to go down the door should be open right so now tricuspid valves open and then the blood goes from right atrium to right ventricle are we clear so the blood is going from right atrium to right ventricle then what happens from right ventricle this is deoxygenated blood guys okay so this blood goes to pulmonary artery through pulmonary valve it also has a door there to enter the pulmonary artery that door is called as pulmonary valve and once it enters the pulmonary artery it goes to the lungs it goes to lungs for purification and then the oxygenated blood will enter through pulmonary veins okay so how is the heart getting like oxygenated blood it is going to enter through pulmonary veins and enter left atrium and now when the left atrium is filled with oxygenated blood it needs to come to left ventricle so the bicuspid valve will open thus allowing the flow of blood from right uh, left atrium to left ventricle it's very simple if you guys think that this is a little bit complicated diagram you can always make your own diagram so all you need to remember is just this four lines this is right atrium right ventricle left atrium left ventricle superior vena cava inferior vena cava it's draining the blood here and from the right atrium if the blood has go has to go to the right ventricle there is this door okay that door is called tricuspid valve i'm going to change the color so that it becomes like little easy imagine this is the heart this is superior vena cava this is inferior vena cava okay so this is superior vena cava and this is inferior vena cava so the blood is going to enter right atrium from right atrium the blood is going to go down to the right ventricle and here this door in between them is called as tricuspid valve and from here the blood goes to lungs for purification and the oxygenated blood and the oxygenated blood enters left atrium through pulmonary veins here the oxygenated blood is entering through pulmonary veins and from pulmonary veins the oxygenated blood what happens is the left atrium is going to push the blood by opening the bicuspid valves and then the heart is filled with oxygenated blood now the heart doesn't just keep the blood for itself it needs to pump it it needs to distribute the blood to all parts of our body and that happens through aorta okay so from aorta the blood is transported to all parts of the body so are we clear with the working of the heart it's very easy right just four steps and then we are done now i have already said this that actually not just this but if you take out the heart and um, still keep it in like a like when you immediately take the heart out it's still pumping okay so 
it can really launch blood to such an extent that you can't even imagine. So like around 30 feet, that's too much, right? So it still pumps blood. Now let us see the heart. So about this, I have told you that heart is located in the stern, right behind the sternum. And um, that is the location of the heart and it's always towards the left side. Now coming to how the transportation is done at like cell level. Like I have told you how the heart is pumping blood, how transportation is done, like blood transportation. We have talked about that. But let us talk about how, you know, transportation occurs in cells, like minute cells. How is it going? How uh, a molecule is entering another cell? Are cells having any transport system or it's just the heart that is having transport system? Actually, plants also have a unique transportation system and even animals have and also at cellular level, we do have a very interesting transportation system. So let's talk about osmosis. Okay, so this is a salt water fish and this is a fresh water fish. Now, what do we notice? And do you know which one drinks what kind of water? And how does it really drink water? And how are the, how is a tiny fish drinking water? You know, it sounds a little bit like different kind of a question but there is a difference between a salt water fish and fresh water fish and I want you guys to know more about it explore and ask your parents but before that I want to tell something about osmosis so osmosis is a process where the movement of water molecules occur from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration okay so what is osmosis it is basically the movement of molecules from lower concentration to higher concentration so it is defined as passive movement of water molecules across a partially permeable membrane now what is meant by partially permeable means it allows movement of few molecules and does not allow movement of few molecules okay that is what is meant by permeable and partially permeable means it only permits few of the molecules to let it in and out. So we are clear with osmosis, right? So osmosis means movement of molecules from a, from a region of lower solute to higher solute. Like easy way to remember is think like this is the plant or something. How the water movement from lower to higher. You all know that, right? How water is transported from roots to all parts of the plant that is nothing but osmosis okay so the water is coming from a region of lower concentration to region of higher concentration so there is a different term which is used for transportation of materials from a region of higher concentration to lower concentration do you guys know what it is i'll be answering about that at end of the class so i hope we are clear on this now coming to types of transportation. So there are basically two types of transportation. One is the passive type and one is the active type. Okay. So passive by the name itself, it is like slow. Active means it really needs to pump and do some action. So in passive, you have diffusion, osmosis and facilitated diffusion. Okay. We'll be talking about that in detail later. But for now, remember that active transport always requires energy, right? Why? Because it, it needs to push. So therefore, it requires more energy and it acts like a membrane pump. Okay. So there are also two kinds in it. One is endocytosis and exocytosis. Remember this easy trick. Exo means exit. Endo means inside. Endocytosis means it allows molecules to enter inside the cell and exocytosis means it helps to push out of the cells. Okay, so isn't it easy? Endo means inside, exo means outside. Now let us go through each of the types of passive and active transportation. The first one is simple diffusion. Okay, so I have told you that passive does not require much effort but in diffusion what happens is the molecules are entering because there is a gradient difference 
okay so due to some random movement of molecules some can cross the cell membrane wall so suppose think this and this molecules they are able to enter from here to here and how are they entering because there is some kind of gradient difference so molecules move down their concentration gradient from a high to low concentration okay so molecules move from a gradient concentration that is from high to low and those molecules are small non polar and uncharged okay so why is the diffusion happening because the molecules are able to diffuse only because there is a gradient difference okay and that to only from high to low so diffusion means transfer of particles from a gradient of higher concentration to lower concentration so let me repeat three things again passive transportation has three parts first one is diffusion in diffusion the molecules move from high to low and it happens because of gradient difference and they are small and they are non polar and uncharged molecules now coming to facilitated diffusion here this structure is of a potassium ion channel okay what happens is this is not very clear picture but facilitated diffusion by the name itself what is meant by facilitated means it only allows certain kind of particles to move in okay like this potassium ion channel will only allow potassium uh, substances to move in it's not going to allow sodium channel so that is what is meant by facilitated diffusion where movement is down concentration gradient again to high to low and the molecules that are too big and charged they cannot get in because like suppose thing this is too big it won't go inside right so only the ones which can move inside are the ones that are going to go inside so some protein channels are open and closed example sodium channels and nerve cells is just one of the example so here you can see facilitated diffusion what is happening you see like only few are going in okay not everything can go in that is what is meant by facilitated now coming to passive transport what do you see here i can see a phosphoryl lipid bilayer so there is two layers right of phospholipids and there is a hydrophobic channel and there is a hydrophilic channel hydrophobic means it is what is hydrophobic fear of water and hydrophilic is going to take in water so it has two channels so here the passive transport is going to happen and this is an integral protein okay so it's clear right so this is how the passive transportation of material is going to happen now coming to active transport or membrane pump so you all guys know which is the membrane pump in the cell i have discussed this in the previous topic it happens in mitochondria and particles are moved against their concentration that is from low to high that's why active transport means low to high and passive transport means high to low so low to high like imagine you are moving a dumbbell from low to high you require strength rather than just dropping it right so this is the active transport and this is the passive transport that's all you need to remember okay so like i told you atp is the powerhouse of the cell and we have spoken about like active transportation occurring in the cell in the mitochondria and here energy is required example is sodium potassium pump now coming to um active transport this is just a depiction of how the active transportation is occurring inside the cell now coming to vesicle why does it really look like a vehicle a vesicle is a membrane bound compartment used to shuttle substances around and within the cell now what do i mean by that is this is a vesicle right it kind of looks like a cart right what is the function of this vesicle is it helps in movement of things around the cell like from one place to another it helps in moving things 
so basically vesicle vesicle can also be said as vehicle because it is used to shuttle things like how a shuttle train if you sit in a shuttle train in airport you go from one point to other point right similar way this vesicle is going to help in transport like for example you need to transport this particular thing it helps in transporting it from one part to the another okay now so we have learned what is the function of the vesicle and here if you have to transport this tiny part who helps in doing so vesicle helps in doing so so i hope you are clear about active transport and passive transport for now and now let's go to endocytosis like i have told you endo means inside the cell okay the transportation happening inside the cell and here what happens is if suppose a particle needs to enter the cell it is going to form a foldings here so that the cell enters inside okay so this is how endocytosis occurs so it's going to fold in and take in the particle inside example is phagocytosis now phagocytosis occurs in amoeba where whenever it sees food it forms like a false feet and it's going to engulf it that is what is called as phagocytosis so it is also example of endocytosis and exocytosis means here you can see it's going to push this out of the cell like here you can see that there are green color particles here right here what is happening it's pushing it out that occurs only because of exocytosis and here there is a picture of letting these green particles inside the cell that is called as endocytosis okay so endocytosis means you let the particles inside the cell exocytosis means you push the particles outside the cells okay are we clear so we have studied about endocytosis and exocytosis this is just how a protein is being transport transported over here this is the nucleus this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum and here these are the transport ve vesicles which are acting like a vehicles and then from there it is going to give some products which are going to go out of the cell so out means exit exit means exocytosis so that is the process and how a vesicle is formed is um, what in a similar process which i'm going to link a small video but for now we need to remember a very simple differences in this like what is meant by diffusion what is facilitated diffusion what is osmosis what is active transport with carrier proteins and what is endocytosis and exocytosis so before that like i have told you right diffusion happens because there is a pressure gradient difference and um, diffusion facilitated diffusion and osmosis is easy because it's going from a high concentration to low concentration but whereas active transport means from lower concentration to higher concentration and facilitated diffusion means for example you have a potassium ion channel so what happens in that what happens is if there is some other sodium ion there what will the potassium channel do the facilitated diffusion it takes care that sodium is pushed out only potassium is going to come in that is the function of the facilitated diffusion and osmosis we have already discussed active transport i have told you example is like uh, powerhouse of the cell atp formation how it is transported active happens from it requires lot of energy because it is pushing right from lower to higher and now endocytosis and exocytosis endocytosis means endo means inside is how you need to remember exocytosis means pushing out of the cell that is exit okay so endocytosis what happens is it takes the particle inside now let me give you a example okay you all know about amoeba right so suppose think this is amoeba amoeba basically looks like finger projections and this is the food particle now if this is the food entering what does this amoeba do is it's going to form false feet like this and then it is going to eat it okay so this process is called these are pseudopods or false feet and the way it's going to eat is called as phagocytosis the process of forming false feet and then engulfing the food okay so this is also an example of endocytosis whereas suppose if i need to get rid of something from here 
if I open this and let it out, that is exocytosis. As the name suggests, exo means exit, endo means inside. So this is how you guys need to remember. So I have explained about osmosis and like diffusion, active transport, passive transport and everything. Now we will talk about how transportation is done in the plants. Okay, so how is the transportation done in the plants? So I have told you about cellular level how transportation is done but in plants they have an interesting mechanism they have a different mechanism for transportation of water and they have a different mechanism for transportation of food so xylem helps in transportation of water okay whereas phloem helps in transportation of food okay so here you can see xylem is only doing the transportation of water like a one way like look at here their walls are thick whereas phloem walls are thin and um, they have a hollow structure whereas these have like perforations and here water and minerals are distributed and here water and food is distributed. So based on the diagram, what are the differences that you guys can write between xylem and phloem? So for xylem, it is transportation of water is done in xylem. Whereas in phloem, transportation of food and water. Let me tell you something interesting. Xylem cells are usually dead and they are hollow. Whereas phloem cells have pitted appearance. And this is one way transportation system and this is two way transportation system. The walls are thick the walls are thin in phloem. So these are the differences. So let's go through it again. So xylem helps in transportation of water and it's only one way from roots to all parts of the plant. Whereas in phloem it is two way flow. That is it transports water and food from lower level to higher level and also from higher parts to the lower parts. And in xylem, it is thick walled and the cells are usually dead and they are hollow. Whereas phloem cells are thin walled and they have perforations. So these are few of the differences that you need to remember about xylem and phloem. So plants don't have heart. That is the reason that they have xylem and phloem. And let me tell you guys something interesting. So this xylem and phloem, what are they? Are they hard for the plants or what are they exactly? They are called as, they are the parts of vascular tissue. Plants have four important types of tissues, okay. They have dermal tissue, vascular tissue, ground tissue, okay. So there are many tissues, but one of the vascular tissue, one of the tissue is called as vascular tissue and xylem and phloem are a part of that. So it's not the heart that's helping the plants, it's the vascular tissue that is xylem and phloem that are helping the uh, plants to transport minerals and waters. Now, what is transpiration? Everyone knows about water vapor, right? When you see in the early mornings, you can notice like a dewy kind of look on the uh, leaves. Like you can see a very small drops of water. And there is, what is it? Do you guys know what it is? So what happens in the plants is usually there is loss of water. Okay. There is loss of water from surface of the leaves. Like you can see such small drops of water. That is called as transpiration. What is it called? It is called as transpiration. 
Transpiration is the loss of water vapor from the stems and leaves of the plant. So what is transpiration? It is the loss of the water from the stems and leaves of the plant. Light energy converts water in the leaves. So this is the light energy. It is converting the water in the leaves into vapor which evaporates from the leaf through bean shaped structure like stomata. So these pores open and the water is going to evaporate. Okay, so light energy converts the water in the leaf into vapor. So how is the vapor formed from the leaf? It's converted like the sun it has light energy, right? So when it falls on the leaf, it's going to evaporate. The water which is present in the leaf is going to evaporate. So this is pretty much about the transpiration. So transportation of food and water is done by xylem and phloem and transpiration occurs in the form of water vapor through leaves. Okay, new water is absorbed from the soil by roots, creating a difference in pressure between leaves which is lower concentration and roots, which is a higher concentration. So this is a plant. Okay. Now what happens is here water has evaporated, right? So this is leaves. You all guys know these are the roots. So here you have low concentration and here you have high concentration. Okay, so whenever there is a pressure difference, right? So here there is a high concentration, here there is a low concentration. So water will flow through xylem. Now the water is going to move up only through xylem. That's why it has one way flow. Because if there is no concentration there, what's the point in transporting water back? First, you need the water to enter up, right? So whatever the water is lost in the form of the water vapor, that is replenished with the help of the xylem. Okay, so what does the xylem do? It is going to help the plant regain its water. And let me repeat all of it again. So what is happening because of the light energy, the leaves, when this light energy is falling on the leaves, the water is getting evaporated. So there is not much water. So this leaf has lower concentration. But in the soil, we water the plants, right? So there is a lot of water in the roots. So there is, it is at a higher concentration. This is at a lower concentration. So the plant, what it has a mechanism that is through xylem, there is a one-way flow of water from higher concentration to the lower concentration. So the water reaches from roots to leaves and therefore whatever water is lost, now it is getting back. The plant is getting back the water, whatever has been lost. So now I have told you that this exchange of water vapor like exchange of materials as well as like the loss of water in the form of vapor is act through stomata. Okay, so stomata are the pores that are present on the underside of the leaf which facilitate gas exchange that is needed for photosynthesis. Like you all know what is meant by photosynthesis, right? Sunlight, the raw materials required for the photosynthesis are sunlight, chlorophyll, water, carbon dioxide and the plants is going to give out food and oxygen. So this thing taking in carbon dioxide, giving out oxygen, this exchange of gases is happening through stomata. Okay, so where is this exchange of gases happening? That is carbon dioxide coming in, oxygen going out, happens through stomata. stomata. As photosynthetic gas exchange requires stomata to open, transpiration will be affected by the level of photosynthesis. So only during the process of photosynthesis, the transpiration process will be affected. So... I hope you guys have understood how transportation is done in humans, how transportation is done in plants, that is through xylem and phloem, how transpiration occurs in plants, that is through water vapor. And we have also studied what are the types of transport system that occurs in the cell, that is active transport and passive transport. 
So let's take a quick quiz along with me and I'll be asking a few questions. So even you can try to answer it in your notebook or you can like answer along with me. Okay. So, so transpiration is gain of water. Is this true? Is this true? It's absolutely false. Why? Because transpiration means loss of water. So what happens is when sun, this is the sun that gives the light energy. So sun, when it falls on the leaves, water is going to get evaporated. And this water, when it evaporates, there is difference in concentration in the leaves and the roots. But for now, transpiration means loss of water from the plants. And this process is called as transpiration. in the form of water vapor. So loss of water from, from the plants in the form of water vapor is called as transpiration. Now, I'll ask you a question about heart. Why do we need lungs to purify the blood? in circulatory system can anyone tell me because i have always thought as a kid that circulatory system just involves heart i have never thought that lung plays a role and you must be also wondering why do we really need a lungs right so do you know the answer why do we need so all the impure blood is going to enter heart Right. Now, heart has to pump blood to all parts of the body. So, do you think that we should pump deoxygenated blood, that is impure blood to all parts of the body, then we would be dead. You know why? Because the blood has a lot of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is a waste product which we need to get rid of. We need oxygenated blood and who takes out carbon dioxide and gives in oxygen in our body is done by lungs that is respiratory system so what do lungs do they remove carbon dioxide and give oxygen right so this role is being done by lungs so if we don't have lungs we won't have oxygen so from here the impure blood goes to the lungs and in lungs what happens is it gets purified so the blood becomes oxygenated and then enters heart okay so why do we need lungs so that our blood is oxygenated we don't get deoxygenated blood all through our body so we definitely need lungs to purify the blood and circulatory system because it is the one who is going to change deoxygenated blood into oxygenated blood and distribute to all parts of the body. So the blood has oxygen, not carbon dioxide. Okay. Now, facilitated diffusion is permeable to all is it true or false example is suppose think this is a potassium channel so what do you think is facilitated diffusion going to allow all the molecules to transfer from one place to another i don't think so because by the name itself, when you don't understand something, break the word. 
so facilitated means it allows only few things okay so suppose think this is potassium ion and this is sodium ion okay actually let me give you a example showing the structure so these are the potassium ions and think i want to draw something different okay so what happens is facilitated diffusion only allows these molecules to come and it's going to leave these behind so facilitated diffusion is a process where there is transportation of materials in a semi permeable way okay it does not allow all the substances to transfer so it's going to allow only few of the things so semi permeable so facilitated diffusion means diffusion of particles but in a semi permeable way now what is the difference between endocytosis and exocytosis so let us talk about the differences between endocytosis and exocytosis now coming to endocytosis so like by the name itself i told you remember exo stands for exit okay so endocytosis means a clear example is amoeba now think this is an amoeba okay now it sees yummy food particle so what does it do is it forms pseudopods okay so it forms false feet or pseudopods and then it is going to engulf it completely okay so endocytosis means the particle is entering inside the cell just remember that the particle is going to enter cell whereas in exocytosis what happens is the particle is going to exit the cell okay so exocytosis means it's going out like a clear example is suppose think i need to show you guys what is exocytosis this is exocytosis that is the particles are going out of the cell okay so endocytosis means the particles are entering inside the cell exocytosis means they are going out of the cell so i hope you guys have understood everything about the transportation in humans how it happens in cellular level what is active transport what is passive transport and how transportation is done in plants that is through xylem and phloem that is xylem helps in transportation of water phloem helps in transportation of food and water what is the process where the water is lost from the leaves in the form of water vapor is called as is called as transpiration okay so i hope you guys are clear with transportation and thanks for watching and stay tuned to classroom tv